Colony fans. It is time for the next edition of Colony, the official podcast. In this episode, we are going to find out the inner workings of episode four of season three. I'm Tara Bennett, your host and a senior editor and producer for Sci-Fi Wire. And we're always, always thrilled to be able to welcome back the architects of all of this wonderfulness, co-creator and executive producer Ryan Condal. Hello. And executive producer and writer extraordinaire, Mr. West Took. Thank you for having me. And is Ryan mad at me again? Once again, you know, yeah. No. <laughs> I, Wes's writing skill always gets called out. It's it's fine. I'm, I'm, I've accepted it and I'm, I've moved on. I mean, that's why he's on the show, right? I mean, that's why he's here. He's because he's a he's a writer. I mean, that's why we have him. So it's good that he's a he's a good writer. Yeah. I'm I'm fine with that. He's fine with I'm that. Totally fine with that. <laughs> so much tension in the room. But we're going to shift over to our other guest, another newbie to our show, but not a newbie to anybody that watches great television, especially in the last couple of years, because this man has made some incredible characters on all kinds of TV shows from Outlander to Preacher. And now to Colony, we have Mr. Graham McTavish. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. It's so wonderful to have you here. Nice to be here. And I'm not a writer. No, so no. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> makes things a lot easier, I think. Yes. <laughs> the tension's suddenly diffused. Yeah, it's all wonderful. Right. Everybody's right. happy. Help. It's wonderful. Yeah. We got to meet your character, who is McGregor, the leader of the resistance camp. And knowing that you had worked with Ryan before and mm. that he desperately wanted to work with you again, um, probably shouldn't have shared that because now you, know, you have all the power. Um, uh, <laughs> a lot of desperation <laughs> at this microphone today. Make him come back. <laughs> um, know that he really wanted to work with you again and find the right project when the character was presented. What were your first thoughts in terms of what kind of guy this was and what was interesting for you to play? Well, I was first of all delighted that Ryan asked me to do it. I wanted to work with him as well. We'd had such a great time the first time we worked together, and this was a great opportunity to get back together. But in terms of Andrew McGregor, he's just a great, strong individual. He's a man who has a very singular vision of what is coming, and he knows what to do about it. I think a lot of people might look at a character like McGregor as, I don't know, bombastic, possibly a bit self-obsessed, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I tend to try and see, I remember I was in makeup on one occasion on the show, and one of the makeup artists said to me, what's it like to play such an evil character? And I, I sort of stopped and I said, you think he's evil? Mm. And I really don't. Yeah. I really don't. I mean, I know that the background to some of um, the whole story of Colony and how it, the aliens and all the rest of it is very much based on the occupation of France. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, correct. And the attitude of the French towards Nazi occupation, that they were split pretty much across the Vichy France line or the resistance. Yeah. And the French resistance are hailed as these extraordinary heroes and they're absolutely marvellous people. And uh, Yeah. And I think Andrew McGregor is cast very much in that mold. Right. He is somebody who believes that the only way to stop these people is to properly resist, or rather not people, but these aliens. Yeah. He's a man of action, not a man of compromise, let's put it that way. He is the conspiracy theorist that was totally on point. <laughs> so he was tell onto me, it. Yeah. He was totally onto it. So tell me about the really fun twist of being able to explore that idea because everybody just kind of part and parcel goes, yeah, you're just a nut. And this is not the case. Well, that's why we opened with this teaser. We thought it was really important to show that he's not just bombastic. He was right. Yeah. And he was right about that. And he might be right about this. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's fun to play on the trope of the guy who lives in the bunker who right. is probably crazy. But in this particular case, it just opens up all these questions in episode four that cast questions about episode three, which is, are the bums on the right side of this? Yes, exactly. Does McGregor really know what's coming? Mm -hmm. Is his point of view completely valid? So when you get into the dramatic heart of the episode and you put these two things in conflict, you're not exactly sure who to root for. He's muldering, has a lot of valid things to say. And when you let somebody like that know that they're right, then there is more of a strident attitude that they can take and that we really see with McGregor in this episode of going, no, 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 I really was right and I'm protecting everybody. And he's seen the consequences, right? Not only did he lose his family, but presumably off screen, he lost his family in a horrible way, which is that they were told that he was into child pornography. Oof, yeah. And he, mm. he knew this thing was coming and tried to prepare and tried to bunker down and he was screaming into the wind and no one was listening and it happened anyway. And that sort of thing only would serve to reinforce in a person's mind, I presume, that you need to stand up for your principles. You need to stand up yeah. for what you believe in at all costs. You have to trust your own instincts. Absolutely. You know, he can only rely on himself. I mean, that's what his history has proven to him. Yes. That he has to be the one that makes the decisions because if he doesn't, then things go wrong. 
Well, those things that go wrong are the Bowmans because they walk in the door. So, yeah. <laughs> so those tell- pesky Bowmans. <laughs> They're the harbingers of death in our show. They just yes. everywhere the Bowmans yes. go, they ruin <laughs> lives. Chaos ensues. Death follows. Yeah, very good looking, but yeah. <laughs> problematic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me about finding a mindset to have a character's point of view about technically the protagonist of the tale. What justifies his thought process about the Bowmans in terms of they're just being enemies and that's it? These are people that could probably hurt our way of life. It's always very interesting playing those sort of people because I think his life has been shaped by sacrifice. Mm. You know, the sacrifice of his reputation, yep. the sacrifice of his family, family, the sacrifice of his good name, even before any of this happened, people just regarding him as a nut and all the rest of it. And when you've been shaped by that, I think you have a very, very harsh view of others. I think you you look at the world in a pretty binary kind of way. Yeah. You're either with me completely, as evidenced by how I treat Walid, or you're against me. Yeah. And he's probably, I think, the kind of person that makes those decisions very quickly. I don't think he trusted them as soon as he met them. Yeah. And uh, he just needed to find enough evidence to prove he was right. And he's that kind of guy. You know, he's predatory in some ways. I think. Yeah. He really is. You know, he takes his time. He stalks the truth of this alien invasion that is coming and systematically pieces it together and presents it. This is clearly what is happening. And then that is rejected and all the rest of it. But he takes the same view, I think, with the Bowmans. Yeah. That he's going to very carefully just pick them apart and then expose them for what they are, in his view. All very well said. And uh, we talked a bit about what happened in the backstory immediately before Vincent left the camp to go contact the Bowmans. And we imagined that there was actually this big blowout argument that McGregor did not want Vincent to go out and contact these people. They're outsiders. They're dangerous. They say they have this thing that the entire occupation is looking for in the gauntlet. We don't know whether they do. This could be a ruse, a trap, or they could have it. And then they're the most wanted people running around in the woods Mm -hmm. and behind them will shortly follow the occupation itself. So we imagine on the Bowman side, I mean, I think Katie, particularly still with these romantic ideals of being a member of the French resistance in her mind, she comes into the camp expecting to be hailed not only by Vincent, but by McGregor as a conquering hero and, and this great resistance fighter. And on the other side, this is a last ditch attempt by Vincent to try to have some agency in in this world of resistance, believing the Bowmans, seeing the gauntlet, knowing what it is, and thinking that if I can bring this back and we can actually tilt the table in our favor a little bit, maybe I'll restore my standing with McGregor Mm -hmm. and uh, he'll forgive me for this transgression. (laughs) But (laughs) as we we realize, he's a very unforgiving kind of guy. This this doesn't sound like all all things that are going to go go Vincent's (laughs) way particularly. And McGregor also has this other side which kind of comes out in this episode, which is he's not particularly interested in having his mind changed about right. uh, the condition of things. So when the rap introduces a bunch of new information, at least new as McGregor sees it in episode three, I think part of it, rightfully, McGregor questions. Right. This could all just be nonsense. They're yeah, feeding lies, us right? to set mm-hmm. us against each other. He's been speaking to everybody like Moses come down from the mountain yes. with the tablets. <laughs> and uh, this changes everything in a way that does not make McGregor happy and makes him feel out of control, which is not a place that he likes to be. I love in this episode, too, that you really have set up Snyder, who has spent basically all of his proxy time, time in the green zone, time in the politics of what's been going on to read people. And he knows that McGregor is not somebody to give them time to maybe see our side. He really knows, no, 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 no. We need to get the hell out of here. And I love yeah. that being able to see, because um, we don't always trust Snyder. We don't always know where he's coming from, but he certainly does have a laser precision in terms of reading personalities. Yeah. That charming East. Easter Island statue who runs this place. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just patting myself on the back. You're but, a wonderful uh, writer, Ryan. Yeah, well, thank you. You are. Thank you. Thank you. Just trying to get the uh, intro for the next episode. <laughs> he has to earn away. it here. There you go. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, Snyder, you know, Snyder in a way knows the McGregor type more than anybody. He's run into a lot of people exactly like this in and throughout the occupation. If you packaged a McGregor like character in a suit with a smile, Snyder knows that person yeah. and knows them very well. And he does not trust hardliners at all. I mean, Snyder is. A lot of things, he is not a hardliner. No. Snyder also very quickly identifies this place as a colony. This is run like a colony. There are curfews and walls and armed guards, and you can only say and do certain things. You're yep. expected to show up at a certain place at a certain time. There are rations. That was the fun, I think, for Wes and I in crafting this place, was looking at it like 
people are expecting, again, because this is a genre show, they're expecting the Bowmans to show up and find John Connor out there in right. the woods fighting <laughs> in the war against the machines. That's not at all what they find. And they find this place that's run in a very hard line way, very successfully. I mean, McGregor's been incredibly successful because of the way that he's approached this, but it requires that level of dedication. Yeah. And again, calling back to Castro and Guevara and, and their conflict in the Sierra Maestras, all feels very similar. These resistance movements are never black and white. They're always highly political. There's yeah. always a lot of ego and narcissism involved at the head of it. When you're trying to draw the most dangerous cocktail for this place, you're also trying to think about ways to play people off of each other. So McGregor is an ideologue, right? Mm -hmm. And very clearly, Snyder is terrified of them right. because he's a pragmatist. They're at opposite ends of the spectrum. And then Vincent's a moralist. So you have these totally different perspectives. And of course, they're going to come into conflict. Mm. Yes. Sorry, I'm just nodding in, in sort of admiration of that. That's very good. Yes, yes, it's true. You also have Parallel Story. We're still keeping up with where Broussard and Amy are as they're navigating and moving more north. Tell me a little bit about how you wanted to progress. From the last episode, there was a loss of life. There was a moment where they had to trust each other to survive to get out of that situation. Where does that push them in this episode in terms of coming together and, and actually really feeling like they're two people that are working together? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in this episode, we knew that Broussard's blind trust of Amy wasn't going to last all that long. And <laughs> he has a very for Amy, uncomfortable encounter with her in the woods where he does everything but point a gun in her face right. and asks her if she's lying to him. They have this encounter as they're going out of Broussard's comfort zone and making contact with this resistance camp that he knows nothing about. Amy has all this information because she was part of this communications network, so she knows the protocols, who to communicate with him yeah. and how, and how you find out where this camp is. And, right. and she's also breaking protocol herself in yeah. order to do this to find this place. So he's very uncomfortable with all of this. And then just as they happen to contact this very squirrely guy, who's living on a bus, gunshots are heard, and the place gets raided by the IGA, and they barely get out of there with their yeah. lives. And Broussard is rightfully, I think, wondering, what the hell have you gotten me into, and what yeah. side are you on, and what's all going on? But Amy is a very trusting person, straightforward person. She hasn't had the same experiences of betrayal and lies and politics that Broussard has, so she just looks in his eye and tells him the truth, and like, you either trust me or you don't, but yeah. you have to make the decision. I'm not going to stand here and try to justify myself to you. We see this as a further evolution of the relationship. Relationship. And again, going back to what I was saying in the last episode, Broussard now finding himself in a place where he knows that he necessarily has to find people to mm -hmm. trust in this world if he's ever to accomplish what he's been fighting for and sacrificed so much for. He realizes that Amy is probably as good as it's going to get. I mean, they've yeah. fought together, they've seen people die together, and if they're going to make their journey north and get to this resistance camp or wherever else they're going, they're going to have to do it together. I think this is also a good moment to talk about. We've been able to be exposed to some of the actors coming here and talking on the podcast, and you yeah. realize how much thought they put into their roles, and how over the course of a series, eventually, actors start to safeguard their roles. They start to understand things about them that maybe you as a writer might have forgotten. So, yeah. for example, in that scene with Amy, it was originally scripted that Broussard pulls out his gun, and Tori said, Broussard doesn't pull out his gun unless he's going to shoot someone. I don't need the gun, which yeah. is an incredibly smart thing to say about that scene and elevates the scene entirely. You know exactly what the subtext is there. Of course, he doesn't need to pull out his gun. Yeah. Those micro choices that are being made by both our guest cast and by our core cast that are so, so, so helpful in the writing of these things. I'm sure it makes writing exciting for you guys, too, because it jazzes up or just boosts your own perception of what you've created. Right. And the core cast being so, I think Graham can speak to this, but to our perspective, welcoming and giving and generous with people who come in and allowing them the room and space to give great performances. Yeah. I mean, Peyton shows up and she's dropped into this yeah. environment where she's really only interacting with Tori. They're yeah. kind of on an island. And Well, she, we didn't put her in with Isabella because Isabella's a, you know. Stone cold. Killer, stone just, cold you know, very unforgiving. Does not like, <laughs> you know, new people coming to Do not give her a note. I, I've never seen <laughs> Graham weep openly in, in public before, but I mean, Isabella, yeah. their first, your first encounter. Yeah, yeah it was, it was, it was unforgiving. Not it was yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 would, I mean, it's probably better you didn't tell me in advance because that would have just made me more frightened. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I had to break every now and then and go away and just collect myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can see that. I can. She's definitely. been working longer than all of us. That's so true. She's really seasoned professional. <laughs> Bart actually pointed out this thing on a cut where she starts to cry and she realizes it's in a very close shot. And she realizes that one of her tears is just kind of the end of her eyelash and waits until the optimal moment to very delicately blanket so it'll roll down her cheek oh at the precise gosh. moment. That's just craft right there. Yeah, no, she's going to wipe us terrifying. all out. That's... <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually afraid now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like, has their skills. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now that we're on the Isabella tangent, you do have to tell the great story about throwing her lines. Oh, yes. We complimenting just, her. And so people have seen the season premiere. There's the one of our favorite scenes is the card playing scene between yeah. her and Snyder. 
Well, we were running a little short in the episode and we had an hour in the day to fill something and I had 20 minutes to write something. So I kind of whipped it off. I mean, we're literally walking up with handwritten lines. Wow. We're, gonna shoot, we're just going to pick up the scene and see what happens. Yeah. And you give it to Peter and then you give it to Isabella. We shot Peter's side first, took 45 minutes. So now we had 10 minutes to swing around in Isabella. She crushes it twice in a row, <laughs> two totally different performances. She's walking out, just, you know, going back to school or whatever. And I walk up and I say, you know, she's very small. So you're yeah. being kind of the adult jackass and Thank you, little girl, for, you know, for your learning your work. For, for learning a line so quickly. And it's, I was just so impressed with that. And she looks at me and goes, David O. Russell used to do that to me all the time. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just limped off. <laughs> I'll be in my trailer. And, yeah. and licked your wounds. Yeah. And, yeah. oh, holy cow. So yeah. uh, if, if Peter is the stallion, then uh, she's the crusher. So there we go. Yes. We've given her a new name. Yep. That's yeah. perfect. Um, another thing uh, that you, I love it. One of the things that you also get to introduce is you start seeding in. We get to see that creative leaflets, New Seattle. Yes. This is really a good question mark for us as an audience to go, well, why in the heck are people airlifting and dropping vats of leaflets? And what's going on up in uh, Seattle? We've had this tradition on the show where we've used graphic artists every season yes. for propaganda posters and on both sides of the conflict, resistance, and occupation. occupation and, yeah. You know, I'm just I'm into all this stuff and I kind of follow this world. So looking for a place to put it on the show and work with these guys I've admired for a long time. So there's this wonderful comic artist, illustrator, uh, Francesco Francovella. Oh, yeah, who, I love him. Yeah, He's who amazing. Who designed that leaflet for us. And we're trying to find new ways to introduce the idea of visual propaganda into the show. But yeah, it seems like most of the colonies seem very to this point, our understanding of them, mostly just Los Angeles, are very closed places that aren't interested in taking on new people. That's why they have 300-foot walls uh, surrounding the city. <laughs> it's <laughs> a giveaway. Isn't as it? you do. Yeah, it's an indicator. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a welcoming wall. <laughs> so uh, so this would be a different take on a colony. And, of course, we don't trust anything that comes the way of the occupation no. in, in this world. So it's this very creepy image, I think, of finding propaganda was airdropped all the time throughout all the wars of history. To our credit, the scene was shot before we ever saw Dunkirk, but the opening of Dunkirk, <laughs> uh, that awesome yeah. yes. opening where all the pamphlets mm. are dropping as the soldiers are trying to get to the beach. It's a core piece of imagery from this kind of world. And uh, we just thought it was very creepy to find this undropped palette of these things out, out yeah. in the woods. And Pepper Sard and Amy wonder what's going on. This is the first real mention of Seattle, which is going to become a runner in the show. And, yeah. and people are going to have to decide what they believe about that place. But they certainly have a different marketing message than Los Angeles ever did. That, yeah. that is for certain. Far warmer, that's for sure. Uh, but again, yes, we don't trust anything in this show. So even if it looks pretty. Hmm. So let's talk about the very dramatic visual of finally Broussard and Amy arriving at the camp. But it is blown up. And we already know that things are not in a warm, happy place, uh, you know, amongst McGregor and what the Bowmans keep pushing back against him. So when it comes more of a, of a place where the Bowmans obviously are not doing what you'd like them to do, they're publicly pushing back amongst your people now, which is obviously a big no-no. Yes. And Vincent betrayed you by even letting them in to a certain degree. You mm -hmm. didn't want them to do it. Mm -hmm. And your kind of right-hand guy who you know you've been able to control quite a bit doesn't seem quite as controllable. No, <laughs> he's not. Um, I think with McGregor, because he does think he's the best man for the job, that takes with it a certain amount of ruthlessness and with people like Waleed's character and the Bowmans, he's not going to take very kindly to any kind of resistance from them. And yeah, with the whole blowing up of the camp and all the rest of it, you yeah. know that, 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 that McGregor has really reached the end of the road somehow in yes. terms of his tolerance of these people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, daddy's had a bit of a hissy fit and... Uh, you know, and this is what happens. <laughs> um, but, the, you know, that element of ruthlessness from an acting point of view, I found very interesting. You know, I've worked with people, directors and producers and all the rest in this industry, who have that ruthlessness. Well, yeah. um, you know, they have to. Yeah. They have to make very, very, very hard decisions. And, you know, in the world of the film industry and the TV industry, that might end up with somebody being fired or they might be replaced or moved or whatever. Whereas in this context, it ends up with people being killed. Right. Um, you know, A little higher but, stakes. <laughs> but it's still basically the same thought process. Right. So somebody like McGregor, I very much modeled on people that I've met in the world that I live in. Mm -hmm. And those kind of personalities who brook no resistance, who will not tolerate somebody questioning... 
especially if, if it's felt that what they're doing is holding up something much better. We need to get to this point and you're in the way. Right. And so, yeah, I find that a very interesting mindset. It's not a mindset that I have. Yeah. Um, Ryan is sitting right here, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So awkward. Yeah, he's, he's, I, I all... didn't want to mention any names. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, Wes. <laughs> Jeez, um, but but it's all in the past anyway now, and uh, this is why I record remotely. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Kev- Kevin and Bean show, uh, after show podcast. <laughs> You're in a completely different time yeah. zone. Oh so, yes, no. So why? Man's a monster. <laughs> uh, anyway. So it's an amazing. You tip have to up. fire somebody on the first day. I told you that's the only way to get them to respect Absolutely. you. They don't listen otherwise. Absolutely. Can we quickly say something about the time shift at the end? Yes. Because we were very interested in doing that. Yeah. Tell me about that. I mean, I think our concept was that you want to feel in the Amy and Broussard story that he's riding to the rescue so that as you're building through the camp, even when it takes- He being Broussard. He being Broussard. Even when it takes a very dark turn, you presume that's where the story is going. And we obviously didn't want to end up there. We wanted to leave the Bowmans with their own problems. Right. And we therefore thought, well, how do you set up the next episode as compellingly as possible? And to have an evocative image, which is this camp is destroyed and you don't know how it happened. Yeah. It's probably a good way to do it. It led to some nightmares in terms of story logistics. Once you realize that these storylines have not actually been in parallel, which you presume right. just you because presume of the way they are, which is great, because of the way they're juxtaposed, then you have to go back and go through all the hoops of making sure. Oh, if you watch this on the second viewing, you understand when those radio calls happen, what is actually happening. Yeah, yeah it is, it's a it lot is of out of time. Yeah. Recharting, which you can future. totally do and should do, is go back and un- unwind it. And once you realize this has been told out of time, I think it's fun to go back and wonder what's actually where we think it's in parallel. What actually is going, on. going on? It's yeah. really fun to do that during the live plus three window. Yeah, correct, <laughs> especially yes. on yeah. a friend's do television. That. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. that's a that's my favorite yeah. time. I mean, to do I would that. definitely <laughs> abandon the NBA playoffs and Who immediately go and rewatch. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. This is far more challenging yeah. television. All the televisions in your house, turn as them well. on, turn them all on, and do it. Just uh, run DVR settings, yeah. record. Oh, it's all good. Even if you watch it live, it's good. It's yeah, perfect. Tell your friends. There is that moment where you go, ah, oh, I thought this was all happening at the same time. So it is so great because there's just a really fascinating idea of can they connect, which yeah. is a great question. I'm sure everybody's fine. Yeah, yeah that's sure. the way the show usually works. Yeah, it was that's how you credit. Explosion, but fortunately, nobody was around when no. it happened. <laughs> well, right, safe. because McGregor had taken them all out to play softball yeah. for the uh, Camp Olympics. It was a group bonding, <laughs> resistance group bonding exercise. That's right, yeah. Playing some cards, maybe sort of murder in the dark. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I wonder, where, wonder how that ends. Um, <laughs> Throwing the ball at the Bowmans instead of trying to get them to hit that, the ball. Yeah, it's all that's good. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. I want to write this episode down. <laughs> no, no, let's go back. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, as always, for you guys being with us and Graham for being our special guest. We so appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, And uh, there's some fireworks to come, literally and figuratively, of next episode. Thank you, Graham. Oh, my pleasure being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening and being with us this week, as always, for our Colony, the official podcast. If you love the show, please let us know by leaving a review, subscribing on Art19, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever your podcast source is. We would love to hear from you. You can post easily on our comment section every week on our Sci-Fi Wire blog when we post the podcast on Wednesday nights. Or you can find me on Twitter. My handle is Tara D. Bennett, and I will happily be able to pass along any of the questions that you may give us. And as always, this show would not sound as amazing as it does without my wonderful team. I'd like to thank producer Bartley Taylor, producer editor Paul Terry, our mixer and masterer Dave Draper, and our engineer at the network studios Mike Casentini, and Trixie, our board operator. Thank you guys so much, and we can't wait to have you with us next week.